Okay, welcome everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Young, Gifted, and Wild About Birds. Uh, and happy Earth Day. Actually, this is the eve of Earth Day, tomorrow's Earth Day. Um, I'm Miley Bull, Senior Director of Science and Conservation for Connecticut Audubon. And our topic this evening is barn swallows. Our speaker is Murray Burgess, who's working on her PhD at North Carolina State University. Go Wolfpack! Yeah! Uh, barn swallows are our most abundant swallow in the world, and they're a member of a group of birds that we call uh, aerial insectivores, which means they only feed on flying insects. And like many of the other aerial insectivores, uh, their population in North America is declining. Breeding bird surveys have indicated that there's about a 40% decline since 1985. Um, Generally, this decline in aerial insectivores goes from the southwest to the northeast, northeast being the more severe of the declines. Um, for instance, uh, in, in, in uh, Canada, barn swallows are threatened and in, uh, in Nova Scotia, they're endangered. So this is, we don't know the reason why this is exactly. There's a lot of information coming in. A lot of it has to do with uh, the abundance and diversity of what we call the, um, uh, the the aerial biomass, those insects that are in the in the in the air above us, and there are billions of insects there. But maybe the changes in those insects, which it's uh, as I said, the uh, the diversity or the abundance has decreased or changed. We don't know. Um, it could be light pollution, which I think uh, Murray is going to talk about tonight. But they are declining. And we're gonna hear more about this from Murray and we'll talk about it um, during the Q&A afterwards. So just a few mechanics. If, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, use the chat to ask the questions. And uh, everyone of course will be muted during the presentation. So we won't hear the rounds of applause right away. Um, closed captioning is available if you wanna use it. Uh, also, I'd like to remind you about our fifth annual Migration Madness uh, Birdathon from May 13th to the 15th. This is a really fun event. Even I go out and uh, stumble around, look for a few birds. It's open to everybody. It, and it, it's not just for experts. It's for um, what level, no matter what level of birder you are. And if you're interested, take a look on our website because everything is right there. And please sign up. It is a lot of fun. We have a good time. There's prizes and awards and stuff at the end. It's really a good time. Uh, for, so let's get on with our presentation. As I mentioned, Murray Burgess is a PhD student in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology at North Carolina State University. I'll give another plug for the wolf pack again. Um, uh, she is conducting uh, field experiments with barn swallow chicks to determine how artificial light affects their growth, their physical development, and their metabolic health. Murray's from uh, Mississippi and now lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, one of my favorite of all states. Um, I've been there lots of times for lots of different reasons. Birding is one of them. So Murray, thank you very much for being with us tonight. It was fun to uh, see you a little bit before the presentation and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much and thank you everyone for coming to my talk. I am going to share my screen and go ahead and get started. So light pollution and barn swallow chicks. Before I get into all that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as was said, I grew up in Mississippi in the suburbs and other suburban Southern regions. And ever since I can remember, I've always loved animals. So as soon as I found out that there was a degree called wildlife and fisheries, I was all over it. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. I went to Mississippi State to get my bachelor's in wildlife fisheries and aquaculture, but I wasn't sure yet what exactly animal I wanted to study or what kind of focus area. I really loved reptiles and I even did some um, camera trap work with um, coyotes and their prey species. But it wasn't until I took an ornithology class that I fell in love with birds and knew exactly what I wanted to do, which was work with birds and in avian conservation. So after I graduated, I moved to North Carolina State and began some training with 
more bird techniques, learning about how to sample them in the field, how to get blood samples, how to ban them. And that led me to my study topic with birds and urban ecology. So with my focus on urban ecology, my overarching question is how do sensory pollutants impact birds? We talk a lot about like our typical pollutants like trash and plastic waste and air pollution, but sensory pollutants um, include things like light and noise and some of these like byproducts from urbanization that people might not think about all the time. So how do sensory pollutants impact birds? Uh, we're going to focus on artificial light at night, commonly known as light pollution. And so we've all seen this. The biggest source is the street lights. Um, it comes from buildings, billboards, especially these big city landscapes where the lights are just on 24-7. Um, the energy from the lights also contributes to carbon emissions. So it's not just the light pollution is also um, contributing to climate change. And this type of pollution increases six to 10% every single year, just because of how many more new developments and new cities are being built and expanded upon. In fact, 80% of North Americans cannot see the Milky Way. If you kind of look at this map on your screen, you see that the like red hot spots are where the most light pollution is all along the Eastern US and the West Coast and kind of keep this map in mind and compare it to these maps. Um, these are maps of um, North America's endemic species, meaning species that are found only here. And if you kind of compare the red areas, the red and yellow areas to where the most species are found, you see that it overlaps a lot with where the most light pollution is. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to see how light pollution affects these different species, because in the grand scheme of things, light pollution is relatively new um, compared to the long history of evolution that these animals have had. Um, so some general consequences of light pollution, because it affects us too. You might know that if there's lights all in your face, you might not be able to sleep. Um, some people are able to sleep with the TV on. I find that I can't have one single little pinprick of light or else I can't sleep. Um, but it's not just lack of sleep. Um, sometimes lack of sleep, if it's repeated enough, can lead to health, health consequences down the line and make you more susceptible to things like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and other things that have been linked back to um, lack of sleep due to light pollution. And that's the human consequences, but for wildlife, we're starting to find that it's the exact same. Um, animals, not just birds or barn swallows, um, need to um, have their circadian rhythms regulated to a certain sleep cycle, and the light pollution throws off that cycle. I often get the question, are all the lights bad? Like what kind of light pollution are we talking about? Um, and the answer to that is kind of all light pollution is bad, but some is better than others. So it's all bad because even the weakest lights have shown to impact sleep. Um, but there are different types of lights that are more harmful than others, such as the blue lights that we find on our electronics. Um, Lights that are better, though, are the ones with longer wavelengths, which translate to um, the reds and the oranges and the yellow lights. Those are better options to have than the blue lights or a full spectrum white light. But all of them have significant impact, especially on wildlife. So if we talk uh, narrow our focus down to birds. Besides poor sleep, many studies have been done that shows that light pollution lowers mating and reproductive success, mostly by um, the birds producing less eggs or not being able to find a partner because the timing of their um, reproductive cycle has been thrown off. They would usually be following the sun and the stars, but the light pollution obscures the sun and the stars and it just throws off their timing so much. 
Um, it also lowers their foraging success. And one of the biggest causes of light pollution is causing building collisions, especially during migration season. A lot of birds rely on the stars at night to fly and guide their way. But of course, with the sky glow from all of the lights in the cities, they get a little bit disoriented and might crash into a building and that really increases the bird mortality rate. So narrowing the focus again down to my research, I'm looking at how light pollution impacts chicks. Um, a lot of studies have been done on adult birds, but none that I know of so far has been done on chicks. So in addition to their sleep cycles, I get to look at how their metabolism is developing and also how they are growing over time in the light. And so why is this a big deal? Um, so under normal circumstances, uh, the mom feeds the chick and the chick gets energy from their food and raises their blood sugar levels. And so those blood sugar levels are elevated throughout the day and then the chick goes to sleep under natural conditions. And while the chick is asleep, their body converts all that extra blood sugar they got from their food into protein. Now proteins are super duper important to chicks because it's um, what makes up their skin, their feathers, their bones. Um, all those components are growing due to protein and protein is also a huge um, power for flight. So the chicks really need the protein to grow and get out of the nest. And of course, as that extra glucose is being turned into protein, the blood sugar levels are regulated in the blood. They remain even and the cycle repeats again. But when you throw light pollution into the mix, the chick gets fed throughout the day, the blood glucose is elevated, but the chick can't sleep due to the light pollution. And so the body isn't able to produce as many proteins because the chick isn't resting. A lot of those um, glucose levels might be being used instead to keep the chick awake and alert, um, maybe as a stress signal because of the light. And even if the glucose isn't being used up as a stress response, it remains in the bloodstream and doesn't turn into proteins. And if you've ever heard of high blood sugar leading to diabetes in humans, well, it, the same thing happens for birds. Birds could potentially get diabetes as well. So which leads me more to my experiments that I conduct as a PhD student at North Carolina State. I have found a barn in Snow Camp, North Carolina, which is a really rural environment about an hour from campus. And I have my big barn and there's about 50 nests in there with about 35-ish nesting couples in a season. And what I've done is I've divided those nests into some that are left alone in natural light and dark cycles and others that I've strung up some Christmas lights as my artificial lights and their nests are lit up with them throughout the night. And that way I can compare how chicks grow and develop and how their metabolism is in the light pollution versus in natural conditions. And as I explained before, it leads me to my hypotheses that a chick in light pollution will grow more slowly, have slower physical development, and two, that chicks in light pollution will have higher blood glucose, which affects their metabolic health. So how do I even go about measuring those things? So here are kind of the four categories of things that I measure. First, with nest monitoring, before the chicks even hatch, I'm counting how many eggs the parents are laying, the timing of like if they're building new nests or when they're putting feathers in, um, how many eggs they lay each day, which is usually about one a day or one every other day. And I keep track of that to see if there's any um, parental influence because of the light pollution or anything like that. And then once the chicks hatch, I start taking body measurements. 
This is collecting their weight, how long their legs are, how big their heads are, how long their wings are growing. And I also track their feather growth. Um, first, the little pins that start to appear, and then the feathers that sprout out of the pins, and I track that as they grow. And finally, I do take blood samples. Um, if you see in the upper right corner, that is a glucometer, and it's the exact same device that people use if you need to like prick your finger and check your blood glucose. Um, it's the same process for birds. I just prick a little vein in their wing, take a drop, and get an instant glucose reading for them. Um, I think these two pictures are kind of funny because I know I'm always grumpy after I have to get blood work done. And I think the barn swallows get a little grumpy and upset with me too. But I also take a big pooled sample of blood, um, meaning I put an entire nest of chicks blood into one tube just so I can have a big enough sample to send off for lab processing for a further in-depth look at their blood glucose and their proteins and how the light pollution might be um, affecting their genetic expression. And I try to do everything as quickly as possible because they definitely do not like to be disturbed and I want to get them back in the nest as soon as possible. And this is not just a picture of what I look like when I'm hungry. This is some of the um, fledg fledglings being fed by their parents. And the parents do all of the work. I do not interfere with the raising process. With the, I don't feed them. Uh, like I said, I just take them out of their nest to do my quick measurements and then put them back in as quickly as possible. I wanted to show these little pictures. I love the barn swallow chicks uh, when they hatch because they're so tiny. They're like the size of a little grape and they weigh only one gram, which is like the weight of a thumbtack. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, so I label them, I take pictures with them um, so I can um, further track as they grow with like these um, picture evidence as well. And if you kind of notice if there's like a little green or a little purple like color on their toes, I do put nail polish on their nails so I can identify individuals in each nest. So one of these is from a nest and it's been labeled the purple one and it's a picture with the date and the ruler so I can keep track of that specific chick over time. Also, I kind of think they're cute. Um, so a lot of people disagree, but I think they're adorable. Um, this is another example of something that might have more to do with the parents' exposure to light pollution than the chicks themselves. Um, this is an example of wing asymmetry, a really extreme example of wing asymmetry. And this could be due to the mother not rolling the egg around during incubation, leading to this uneven growth. And um, research has shown that that usually only happens when the mother doesn't roll the egg around enough in laboratory settings, aka artificial lighting settings. What I would really love to do is also have like a side study tracking the mother's behavior, um, feeding rates and incubating behavior and everything um, to really differentiate what's affecting the parents versus what's affecting the chicks. Unfortunately, I am just one PhD student and don't have enough time or money to conduct that extra study, but it's definitely something to keep in mind as I look at my results and start to analyze them. But light pollution or parent behavior isn't the only thing that affects the chicks. Unfortunately, nature does its thing and eats my research. Um, this is a rat snake that I have tracked and removed multiple times, but it keeps coming back. Last year, it unfortunately ate like a lot of my research samples. And so some snake control is going to have to be done this year when I go out to try to prevent the snake from eating my research. Um, this is a comparison of two chicks at eight days old. On the left, you have one that was raised in light pollution. And on the right, you have one that was raised in natural conditions. 
And if you look at the two of them side by side, you'll notice that the one in natural conditions is a little bit bigger. It also has some feathers starting to sprout from its little pins, the little black tufts on the end, while the one on the left is a little bit smaller and it has no feathers yet. So it's just a little bit behind in development. And I've seen this trend throughout a lot of the chicks where the ones in the natural conditions are growing faster and are a little bit larger um, compared to the light pollution counterparts. And I have collected two years of data so far with my third starting next month. And so far what I've seen is that um, when you compare the two treatments, the ones in the light are more stressed their body condition is not quite as good. They are ending up smaller and they're taking a longer time to fledge, which means um, getting all their adult feathers and leaving the nest. But the one thing that's remained the same between glutes is their blood sugar levels. And I think that this um, kind of indicates that their metabolic health is what is most important to them. They're willing to sacrifice not growing feathers as fast or like ending up not as big as long as everything is okay internally with them. It's, um, light pollution has triggered this trade-off. You can either have good body size and poor metabolic health or a okay body size and great metabolic health. But of course, we don't want them to have to have this trade-off. You should be able to have both. And so overall implications of some of the research that I've been doing is that um, there, even though the glucose levels are even statistically, um, there is still like a little bit of a trend toward having higher glucose levels in the light pollution nests. And so we want to keep monitoring that to see if there's a higher risk of metabolic disease throughout the um, barn swallow populations. Another great addition to the study would be um, seeing the generations of barn swallows and like measuring them after year after year to see if they have maintained the same kind of metabolic condition or if they have all regulated themselves out after a year. Um, another consequence is that slower fledging, of course, means increased vulnerability for the chicks. It means that there's a longer time that they're dependent on their parents for protection from predators, um, dependent for food. And it also means on the other side, that's more work for the parents to put in with raising a nest. And barn swallows usually lay, lay at least two clutches per season. I've seen a lot of my birds um, at my barn, they lay three, sometimes even four in the control nest, but in the light pollution nest, they struggle to make it to two. And so taking that longer amount of time means that you don't lay as many eggs, you don't raise as many chicks, and that overall reduces population size. And overall, if this continues on a broad scale throughout many, many years, we could see a phenotypic or evolutionary shift of barn swallows and all types of songbirds as they might get a little bit smaller or a little bit um, underweight throughout all time. And that is mostly just for the birds that can adapt to that kind of light pollution pressure. We definitely have a lot of species that cannot adapt that quickly and might just die out if this issue of light pollution, combined with all the other issues of climate change and all the other regular pollution are not resolved. So speaking of resolving this, what can we do to protect the barn swallows? Well, the three potential solutions are turn off the lights, establish protected dark zones, or change the lights. And we'll talk about each one of these. I think this headline is kind of funny and sad at the same time. Um, because 80% of people have never seen the Milky Way when they did see it for the first time, they were terrified. And so to prevent something like this happening, the best solution is to turn off the lights. Um, for most people, it is a very easy thing to flip a switch. 
um, is something that every single person can do. And it allows the wildlife in your area to live under their natural light dark cycles to allow their food chains and their ecology to be properly synced up with nature. And of course, benefits for humans lowers your electric bill and hopefully it makes you get a better night's sleep. Um, protected dark zones is basically turning off the lights, but on a larger scale. Um, there are dark sky programs in different states and like protected dark zones in different places. And it's basically a huge area of land that has agreed to turn off all lights at night or for a portion of the night. And the benefit for wildlife, again, is having a larger protected land as a light pollution sanctuary. And for humans, it can be a tourist attraction for stargazing, um, and it works to reduce the overall sky glow. Like if you see on that light pollution map I showed earlier, we want to get many of those areas reduced, and this is how that could happen. But we also understand that it's not always possible to turn off the lights in every single location. It could be a safety concern. But what we can do instead of turning off the lights is changing the lights that we use. So red and yellow lights are less harmful than blue or white lights. LED lights are more energy efficient and reduce carbon and heat emissions. And it is also a great idea to have lights enclosed and facing downward. This is another thing that could help prevent sky glow. So the light isn't just shining all over the place. You only have it facing the specific part that you want illuminated. And finally, motion sensor lights. Again, the idea is to have light only when and where you need it instead of on everywhere all the time. So in conclusion, light pollution is one of the many factors of urbanization affecting both humans and wildlife. Um, it causes sleep issues that lead further down the line to a bunch of more health issues and a lot of physical issues for both humans and wildlife. Um, specifically with my research, it has caused delayed fledging in barn swallow chicks, and which leads to increased vulnerability and less um, population numbers overall. And the goal with urban ecology is to make humans and wildlife live in harmony. And so one of the ways to do that is to simply turn off your lights because you don't want something obstructing your vision like this. You just want to see this. And I kind of sped through that a little bit fast, but I am definitely open for some questions now and like have a good discussion about some of these issues. You're on mute. Oh, there I am. <laughs> That was amazingly interesting to me. Very, very, you know, for all this time, I've been concentrating on the um, on the aerial insectivores, the fact that they're declining because of uh, the lack of or abundance of insects. But there are so many other factors that affect birds besides, uh, especially these aerial insectivores, besides the um, the abundance and diversity of, of insects. Um, uh, one question I was wondering, you noticed that some of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the female swallows weren't turning the eggs over um, as often in, the, uh, in, in your controlled versus the, your, 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 uh, your, your study area. Um, right. Do the birds recover from that? Um, so I've only seen um, three cases in the past two years, and unfortunately, one of those years was the same year where the snake came and ate everybody, so I wasn't able to see them recover from that. Yeah. But um, uh, other research will show that, like, they, they can either partially recover or some just don't recover at all. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the atrophied wing, I would think, uh, would have to catch up pretty quickly to the normal wing before it would, the bird could fledge right. Right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, 
that, that's really interesting. Uh, is there anybody in the in the chat room that has a question? Uh, there are. Hey, everybody, it's Tom Anderson. I will read a couple of questions. Um, so let's see. Dawn wants to know what time frame will your research uh, cover, Murray? Um, it, it sounded like multiple mating seasons. Yes, yeah, so I started in 2020 and have done two field seasons. I'm doing my third this summer, and I'm looking at maybe possibly doing a fourth next summer, but it won't be any more than four years time for this study. And, and how long after that will it, uh, how much longer after that will it take, if all goes well, for you to uh, get your PhD? I'm looking at a fall 2024 graduation, so about a year and a half, hopefully. Um, and Dawn had a follow-up question. Uh, how do the parents react to your taking the chicks out of the nests? They're not too fond of it. Um, the parents kind of fly away when I get up and when I climb my ladder and get up in there and take their chicks. But um, I work as quickly as I possibly can to get them back in the nest. And then the parents come right back and do their thing. Yeah, lucky lucky thing you're not working with jeer falcons. <laughs> <laughs> you, need uh, a helmet. you need a helmet to ban those young chicks. <laughs> Here's a question from Paulette Rosen. She wonders, how often do you take measurements of the chicks? I take, so most of my measurements I am taking every other day. For the blood samples, I only take a couple of times on certain days, like day three, day six, day 10. Um, here's a question from, again, from Dawn. Um, your barn, your barn swallow research subjects actually live in a barn. Where else, where else might barn, barn swallows build nests? Barn swallows like to build nests on a lot of old wooden structures, like silos, sheds you might have in the backyard. You can also find them like on the underside of bridge overpasses. Um, there's one a little group that lives in a little lake bridge, a smaller one right next to me. And so they like wooden structures. Uh, actually, this is a good time to, to, for me to ask Miley a, a question that's sort of related to that. Miley, if um, for people who live in Connecticut, um, are there things that they can do if they think they have barn swallows in their neighborhood to make, to make their property more conducive to them? Yeah, as long as you're not parking your Porsche in the garage, you can leave your garage doors open um, and let the birds come in. There's also a, a, a commercially available uh, ledges that you can put in your, old, if you have an old barn or an old outbuilding somewhere, um, there's ledges you can put in there that will attract the barn swallows to actually come in and nest. Uh, we've, we've done that in a couple of places up at uh, our Pratt Preserve up in New Milford. When they reconstructed the barn after a fire that we put in, because there were a lot of barn swallows nesting there in the past, we put in these ledges and, and platforms for the birds to come in and nest. So they, they'll take it over too. But yeah, if you have an old building, an old barn, an old uh, shed outside, a big one, um, yeah, leave a door open or some, or, or some way for the birds to get in and out. Um, our, our, our volunteer who has the, uh, the swallows here in Fairfield, he leaves the windows open on his garage, the birds come in and out. So yeah, th there are lots of things you can do if you've got the facility, yeah. What, what, are the, uh, what, are the, what are the benefits of having barn swallows living near you? Well, they're aerial insectivores. They eat all kinds of uh, aerial insects. Less I'm not sure. bugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure how many mosquitoes they eat, but they certainly eat a lot of flying uh, insects that are injurious to uh, your, your gardens and, and um, vegetable gardens and flower gardens. So yeah, they eat a lot okay. of flying insects. Um, so for, for Murray, here's a question uh, for someone with the initials VMS, and I, I don't know who that, this person's name is, unfortunately. Um, why do you think the mothers in the artificial lighting condition fail to rotate the eggs as they should? I don't know, that's a really good question, um, which is why I wish I could have like more cameras up there to study the parental behavior. 
But my best educated guess is that they're stressed. The light pollution stresses them out somehow, and they just maybe forget to roll as much as they should, or it somehow alters their behavior to make them not do proper egg care. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if in a controlled situation, if during normal light conditions, the females roll their eggs more at night than they do in the daytime when, when there's more light. So that would mean that possibly um, if you add the light in nighttime, they don't roll the eggs as much as they would normally. But what do I know? <laughs> um, the, the answer is a lot, but, but even if you know a lot, you still can ask the question. That was a good one. Um, uh, Cindy has a question for Murray. Can parent birds see other, the other nests and the birds in their nests? And, and I guess by implication, does that distract them or something? I'm not sure. Um, no, it's not distracting, but yes, they can see other birds in their colony and the chicks in the other nests. I think a colony of barn swallows is usually somewhat related to each other. And so they're all cool with each other and just kind of tend to their own nest and their own chicks. Interesting. Interesting. We, I had barn swallows nest in my garage one year, 2015. They were here for a long time trying to find a place. They actually came into the house once when we had the door open and easily found their way out. But, um, fledged two or three young, came back the next year, but didn't nest the next year. And that was the last, last we saw of them. Anyway, that's, that's um, hmm. just a... a, a, a actually, a, I was going to ask... How do, how do new colonies form um, or, or do they do birds tend to go back to the colonies where they hatched? So a bird's a barn swallow's preference is to go back to the colony where they hatched and return to the same places year after year. New colonies form when the, basically they run out of space and the new colonies usually only form like a couple of miles from the original colony. So they really want to stay in that same area. Great. Okay. So um, here's a question. Um, lo lots of people asking the questions who signed on tonight didn't, didn't use their full names or their real names. So it's hard for me to know who they are. And I apologize. I, I'd like to be able to give the people's names, but I just can't. Um, this question is, you must spend a lot of time on a ladder. <laughs> how, do, how do you manage? How do you manage that? <laughs> yeah. Um you just get used to it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I definitely take my breaks, um, have a snack, um, drink lots of water, <laughs> just be as safe as possible climbing up and down the ladder. <laughs> you, you're doing this work by yourself? Usually by myself. Last year, I did have a couple of field techs helping me out. I'm not sure about this year. Okay. Um, Another question from Dawn, any ideas for how, uh, any ideas how you will accomplish the snake control? That's a great question. I have had a couple of snake control meetings to figure out this exact question. Apparently rat snakes in particular are really, really hard to exclude from places because they are excellent climbers and to can grip onto just about any surface. But um, what I have so far, I've actually changed the type of lights from like Christmas lights to like LED strip lights so that they won't like swoop or hang down at all and give them something to kind of climb on. I'm also trying to put like wide metal bevels, I think they're called, just metal sheets um, on the columns going up so that hopefully they can't like curl around them or find their way up as easily. Um, the rest of it is just like constant monitoring. If I see a snake, I need to relocate it. Hmm. Miley, have you had any, any luck controlling snakes? Um, I've never tried to control snakes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've done a lot of work with reptiles. I, I worked with uh, Yale collecting the, um, doing the uh, synaptic uh, reptile exhibit with them. But um, my suggestion would be to uh, capture the rat snake, put it in a, uh, what we used to use were uh, pillowcases and take it to one of your rival universities and let it go over there. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, I, I suppose if, if you trap and transferred it or caught it and transferred it far enough away, it wouldn't find its way back. But the problem there is you're removing it from a viable population and you're interfering with the normal um, ecology of the area. So. Right. And usually another snake just moves in to take its place. Yeah. Right. That, you know, it's like when you have squirrels at your bird feeder, you know, you, you trap the squirrel and move it out somewhere. And before you get back home, another squirrel is taking its place. Hmm. So a, a, a question that's related to the question about whether swallows return to the same colony or how they find the colony. Do they, do they use the same nest every year or do they build a new nest? That's a good question. Yeah, they mostly use the same nests. Um, there are very few new nests that are built every year, usually only like two or three. Interesting. Um, but they refurbish the nest a little bit every year, right? They put the They do. Bit. Always fresh feathers yeah. and hay and yeah. cow tail fibers in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've seen barn swallows in mud holes outside a barn. Do they use mud for the nests? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they go to the nearby water source and like scoop them up and scoop the mud up in their beaks and like kind of paste it on to the nest. Yeah, they, they mix the mud, I think, with a little saliva that's like a little glue and it mm. glue and it helps glue it together. Let's see. Oh, I have oh. a barn swallow nest with me. Um, the, sometimes the nests um, get too heavy and fall down naturally, um, especially in 2020. There were a lot of storms coming through that like knocked a few down. Um, so this one was one that was knocked down. Um, so it would be um, plastered against the wall like this, and it's just a shallow little cup. This one still has a little hay in it, and they sit in here. Um, usually it would be built up a little bit more. I think some of that got knocked over, but this is what a barn swallow nest looks like. Amazing. That's great. Um, here's a question. Let's see. What method are you using to separate your artificial light nest from your natural ones? I imagine a giant tarp separating the two. I actually don't have a tarp, but so only there's only one small light directly above each nest all of the other lights on the strand are covered up with aluminum foil and so there's not a whole lot of light spillage and I usually designate like this whole beam all the nests in this one row are all going to be light and all the nests in this one row are all going to be treatment to prevent them from mixing Interesting. So, Miley, here's a question that I think, unfortunately, I, I know the answer to. Uh, um, it's directed to you. Does Connecticut Audubon have any programs addressing light pollution, um, such as public education, outreach for residents, and commercial properties? That's a great question, because we are now uh, working with some of our partner groups to form a, um, a dark skies program that's going to start in New Haven which will be um, an effort to get the, the larger uh, buildings to darken their skies, uh, to darken their lights during uh, migration periods. So um, like Murray said, there's, there's these dark sky programs beginning to pop up um, everywhere. And uh, we're beginning to work with one, start, starting one up now uh, with some of our partners. So yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Great. Um... A question from Donna Hansen: Does the bird have a pancre Does the bird have a pancreas, and is insulin ever measured? What's the uh, um, What's the name of your glucose meter? Um, hope uh, <laughs> I hope you are uh, using a small sample device. Yeah, so birds do have pan a pancreas, and they do produce insulin but the insulin doesn't work quite like ours. It isn't really used that much to regulate um, blood glucose levels. And so that's why um, I'm measuring more on the protein side than the insulin side. Um, and the name, the brand name is uh, One Touch. I think it's like, you can find it at Walgreens or like anywhere and it is small and it works for birds. Cool. Um... 
Let's see, there's a long question. I'm not getting a chance to review these ahead of time, so I never know what they're gonna say. <laughs> this is from, <coughs> excuse me, this is from Donna Warren. My barn burned down this winter, horses are okay, and we are rebuilding as soon as trucks can get back into the field. I had dozens of barn swallows, kept track of when they arrived each year and when they left. There were fewer last year, maybe 10 less. I live next door to a big barn that does have swallows. Will some of mine return when the new barn is finished, hopefully early summer? I love them, she says. <laughs> Uh, sorry to hear that it burned down, but yeah, I hope that they will return. I don't have a definite answer for that. I think it depends on like what materials you're using to rebuild your barn with. I know a lot of the newer modern barns don't have swallows in them just because they prefer older wooden structures. Um, another thing that I've noticed with my own barn swallow population is that there have been less and less returning to the barn each year. Um, and I don't know if that's because of my experiment or because of something else that's happening, like further along their range, maybe in their wintering grounds, something is happening. But it does seem like all the populations are just on the decline with less and less each year. And like I mentioned, you know, there are these swallow shells that you can install that will encourage the birds too. So you can find those online, I believe. That's where we found them. Christopher Mandeville asks, how do you differenti differentiate between the effects you're observing that are caused by light pollution and the effects of, of your handling of the chicks and the quote unquote trauma of the repeated intervention? That's a good question. And there is the only way to kind of control for that is for me to handle the chicks in the light pollution and the chicks in control the exact same way. And that way they're all experiencing the same kind of invasive measuring methods. And that way, the differences that I see between them, I know are due to the light pollution, not due to me because they're all being treated the same. That's great. Um, Let's see, Beth wants to know, do you know why they have a preference for wood structures? Would they nest in metal or plastic sheathed, she, plastic sheathed structures? So I think they have a preference for wood because it's more natural. Like before humans came and built all of our structures, um, barn swallows would nest in like cave walls and like other kind of cliff interior structures like that. And so our wooden barns and bridges and things mimic those kind of environments. I'm not sure if they would nest in metal or plastic. In my experience, they have not. In fact, um, the main part of my barn has a wooden roof and they're in, this sec in that section only. There's a little sloping outward part that has a tin roof and they don't like that section. They don't nest there. Interesting. I, I found a barn swallow nest a couple of years ago when I was doing my town in Westchester County for the New York State Brooding Bird Atlas in one of those plastic hoop barns. Someone was was parking his car in there and they nested in there, but it was only it was only a one time thing. They didn't come back. That, folks, is the last question. There were lots of them, but um, wait, here's another question. Another another comment from from Donna. Um, Donna Warren, she says, uh, this, is, this, this is the woman whose barn uh, burned down. She says, thank you. I'm replicating the barn, um, all wood as best I can, but the wood probably will be new. I also mm -hmm. had maybe half a dozen dead babies on the ground under a few of the nests last year. I, I did call around and no one had an idea. Um, I have pictures of the ones who died. Um, I don't know if that's that's not a question, but if either of you have any response, yeah. respond to that. If not, um, I I am hoping along with you that they return once it's all built. Right. Um, Charlie Loudier, who I credit for his perseverance because he couldn't get on the call before, but he stuck with it. Um, he wants to know: Is it possible that the mud nest simply sticks better to old wood than to metal or to plastic? That that could be. Yeah, I, I've only seen them sticking to wood. So maybe that is a reason why. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's a good, good question. Mm -hmm. 
So a couple of thank yous. Um, Robert Buck, Beth, Cindy, they all say it was extremely interesting and thank you. I, um, Miley, if you have anything to add, feel free. Oh, if, not, um, if you want to wrap up. Toward, it's getting towards eight o'clock and Murray, I'd like to thank you so much for your presentation. It was very interesting, very informative. And it was my pleasure to meet you, even though it was electronically. Um, I hope it's one day in person when I'll be calling you Dr. Burgess. Thank um, you so much. That was really a pleasure for us to have you. And it was, it was spectacular. So you can tell by all the questions we had. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, th this was the last of our five young, gifted, and wild about bird presentations this year. So in addition to thanking Murray, I'd like to thank some of the other presenters that were here our previous speaker, Brooke Bateman, Sam Apgar, Jenny Croak, Shannon Curley, and Jose Ramirez, Jose Ramirez Garofalo. So thank you all for, uh, if you're here tonight, thank for your presentations. Last year's series was spectacular. We had 274 people who bought tickets. This year, even more people uh, were able to join us, almost 300 people. So, which brings me, of course, to the most important thank you to the audience. Thank you for to Connecticut Audubon's members and supporters. Our conservation achievements can only happen because of your support. So, good night, and thank you all once again. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. <laughs>